Welcome, this is, This Week in Prophecy, with, James Jacob Prash. Today is February 5th, 2020. From Israel, Jacob. Blessings in Jesus, dear friends. My name is James Jacob Prash, coming to you this week from Galilee in Israel. Welcome to this way, week in prophecy. Greetings in Jesus and welcome in his name. Let's begin looking at this week's events in prophecy, the prophetic significance of events happening now. You know, we're told in Daniel chapter 2, it is the Lord himself who establishes kings and removes kings. He works for his purposes in all kinds of situations, including the political realm. Now, Daniel also shows us that there are principalities, demonic powers in back of these things, Prince of Persia, being Iran, Prince of, of Greece, and so forth. There's a continual spiritual battle manifested in what takes place both strategically and politically in the affairs of the earth especially in the last days and with regards to the prophetic purposes of God for both the church and for Israel. The question we look at this week in prophecy is, is there a conflict of spiritual forces on back of what is taking place in the aftermath of Mr. Trump's proposed peace plan for the Middle East and for the political fiasco taking place in the United States? Let us begin there. There is not only a division in the Democratic Party, there is a division in the American Jewish community. That division is represented by people like Adam Schiff and Senator Charles Schumer from New York and Congressman Jerry Nadler and Debbie Wasserman Schultz, that kind of liberal Democrats, or, or Zuckerman, or on CNN, that kind, and a trend towards conservatism among Jews, political conservatism, represented by Ben Shapiro, represented by Mark Levin, represented by Michael Savage, represented by Mr. Trump's lawyer, Jay Seklow, nice Jewish boy who believes in his Messiah Yeshua. Be that as it may, let's understand what's happening. There's a division in the church, there's a division in society, and there's a division among the Jews. Polarization, polarization, and more polarization. Things continually get polarized. Let's look first at the United States before we move on to events in the Middle East in the aftermath of the peace plan proposal of Mr. Trump, which we'll be looking at as a matter of highlighting it. A political disaster has taken place so far for the Democratic Party, a horrible one for them. Staffers of Hillary Clinton founded a company uh, called Shadows Incorporated who were paid tens of thousands of dollars to design an app that would report the Iowa results from the caucus. Iowa uses a caucus instead of a per se primary, but it helps set the stage for eliminating candidates who are not going to be viable in the later primary elections in other states. The firewall for Mr. Biden is supposedly South Carolina and Nevada. Losing badly in Iowa is not necessarily a death sentence in itself, but it may be an omen of a death sentence. It's certainly embarrassing for Mr. Biden, who came in fourth place following his argument with Senator Warren and following both Bernie Sanders and Mayor Peter Buttigieg, a homosexual candidate for president who has a husband. This is something that never would have happened before and is reflective of the way that the country has changed in a matter that is antagonistic towards God on one side of the equation in one block. The idea of a, someone running for president who has a husband, a man with a husband, would have been unthinkable even 15, 20 years ago, but it's the reality now, and the mainstream media is not even discussing it. It's just accepted as being normative. 
There's spiritual forces on back of this that Mr. Buddha has come up. Now let's understand something. It is estimated that 25% of registered Democratic voters in the United States are Afro-American, but most of them do not like Mr. Buttigieg and the black community of the city in the American Midwest where he is mayor do not approve of his performance as mayor. It is doubtful he can win the election even if he wins the nomination. Mr. Sanders is another issue. He's an outspoken socialist Mr. Trump says a virtual de facto communist. Just point to the squad, point to Venezuela, point to Cuba. Where has communism or even radical socialism ever worked? The answer is no place. It is antithetical to traditional American thinking. Hence, we have this division in the Democratic Party between the centrists, represented by Mr. Biden and Bourdieu, and the radical left represented by Mr. Sanders, Mr. Sanders and Senator Elizabeth Warren. They're fighting among themselves. The Republican Party, however, has largely united on back of Mr. Trump, with the exception of establishment Republicans, such as Mitt Romney, who, of course, is a carpetbagger who went to uh, Utah to get elected as senator from Massachusetts, because he's a Mormon and he wanted to use his Mormon religion to get himself in the Senate, which he probably could not have done in his own state of Massachusetts. This is the reality and the kind of people we're dealing with. Mr. Romney has continually opposed Mr. Trump. He's an establishment Republican. That is a rhino, a Republican in name only. One of those Democrats who sit on the opposite side of the aisle, as he's been described. Well, so it goes. The Republicans are not divided at the moment much. Even left-center Republicans like Susan Collins and Murkowski of Alaska have fallen into line. Mitch McConnell is a establishment Republican, but he's still backing Mr. Trump, as is Senator Lindsey Graham. It's not just the conservative senators like Mr. Cruz, with whom Mr. Trump has had personal conflict during the 2016 primaries, he's still uniting on back of Mr. Trump solidly now. They're united. When people are united, they're a force to be reckoned with. When they're divided, they're a force to count their days unless they can turn it around quickly. And so far, there's nothing that will unite the Democrats other than their common hatred of Donald Trump. All we needed to do was look at the faces of Democratic leaders, including the so-called management or the managers of the impeachment process, Chuck Schumer and others, who just sat there. Even when humanitarian achievements were announced, they just sat there stoically and often wouldn't even clap for things that everyone would clap for, irrespective of their political party or ideology. This reflects a pure hatred. But with the Iowa results blowing up in their face, not even knowing who won, and they still at this moment only have approximately 71% of the results, the Clinton staffers' company shadows miserable failure, some kind of coding or digital error, they claim. Maybe it's helped save the face of Mr. Biden, who came in fourth place, but we don't know as yet. What we do know is Mr. Sanders and Mr. Buttigieg are very close to each other in the range of 25 to 27 percent. Mr. Buttigieg having the upper hand, but not by much. And that may change by the time the rest of the votes are counted, if they ever are accurately counted. Again, this has been politically disastrous for the Democratic Party. It has been disastrous for Mr. Biden, particularly, although the hiccup may help him save face and preserve him from the after effects of what otherwise would have been a very conspicuous humiliation. Now the humiliation is more subdued. Not just a defeat, a humiliation. He was supposedly the candidate representing himself as the one who could unite the party and have the best chance of defeating Donald Trump. Well, the voters of Iowa, the Democrat voters of Iowa, said differently. 
And the Democratic Party establishment is blaming them. They're blaming the Democratic voters of Iowa for the mistake that the Democratic Party establishment has made. This is absolutely disarray. It's a shambles. It takes place at the same time as a very, very persuasive State of the Union address with much appeal to Afro-Americans and other minorities and something that will help smooth over, as it were, or assuage or alleviate the normal sting associated with Mr. Trump's New York style of delivery, which is rather brash and direct. If you're from New York, you understand where he's coming from. It's not seen as rude. But if you are from another area of the country, it might seem very, very rude. It's just a New York matter. But he's misinterpreted and misrepresented by the media for that reason. They play on it to try to portray him as some kind of a vile man, when in fact, most people from New York talk like that, myself being one of them. Be that as it may, let's move on. In addition to the fiasco in Iowa and a successful State of the Union address in which Nancy Pelosi tore up in half the president's speech on television cameras watched by tens of millions, this may very well backfire on the Democrats in congressional elections. Even one of their chief witnesses against Donald Trump uh, John Turley said it was a completely, completely improper the way she behaved. It was a disrespect, not for Mr. Trump personally, simply, but for the Congress and for the institution of the presidency. It didn't look good. Uh, people can talk about Mr. Trump's brash New York manner and his direct speech that offends people and not pulling any punches, so to speak. That's cultural. What Nancy Pelosi did was not simply a cultural way of communicating that appears brash. It was intentionally rude and divisive, and it made the Democratic Party look really bad. My question is, the Lord obviously allowed her to do that, but was she prompted to do it in order to politically damage her cause? Let us move on and look even further. The case against Mr. Trump and the Senate for the impeachment is going to collapse. It is not exactly a, a situation legally for people who are not American or don't understand this, where you have an indictment by a grand jury, which is the House, and then a trial by the Senate. An impeachment trial is different. All the Senate does is votes on the article of articles of impeachment. Does the case brought against the president constitute high crimes and misdemeanors if they happened? Not only did it happen, but does it constitute serious enough high crimes, misdemeanors, things like bribery, treason, extortion, and the equivalent thereof, to remove him from office? There's no guilt or innocent verdict. It's removal or non-removal. The guilt or innocence determines if they're going to be removed from office or not. There's no criminal sentencing or anything that you'd have in a juridical or judicial procedure for a crime. It's simply voting on the articles of impeachment. Did these things happen beyond reasonable doubt? And if they did, do they rise to the level of impeachable offenses? Bill Clinton was impeached, and he was indeed guilty. He committed perjury. He was fined $800,000 for perjury, and he was disbarred as a lawyer for perjury. He was guilty of perjury. Other people may well have gone to prison for doing what he did. He was a perjurer, not just a liar, but somebody who lied under oath. He was guilty. But voting along political lines, his skin was saved by a political vote in the Senate. You need two-thirds of the senators to vote against you. Richard Nixon may have been removed had it gone that far. Instead, he resigned because it was bilateral. But the impeachment process of Donald Trump is not bilateral or bipartisan. 
It is simply an act of political desperation of those who lost the election in 2016 to them inexplicably. And now they're going to face the prospect of losing it again because they don't have a viable candidate. Hence, they are trying to, with political motivation, politically weaponize the judicial process to try to make it the equivalent of a parliamentary vote of, new, of no confidence because America has a presidential and congressional as opposed to a parliamentary system. There's no vote of no confidence. Hence, there's impeachment instead. This is what they're trying to do. Turn a presidential democracy, a presidential constitutional democracy into a parliamentary democracy that works differently because it suits them politically. But it isn't washing. They bought 17 witnesses in the impeachment in the House. 17. They would not allow cross-examination of those witnesses by any lawyers for Mr. Trump. They would not allow the Republican Party to bring witnesses. It was all a one-sided impeachment, politically engineered. We can bring witnesses, you can't, and you can't cross-examine the ones we bring. Notably, they did not bring John Bolton, the former national security advisor to Donald Trump and the former U.S. ambassador to the United Nations under Mr. Bush. Mr. Bolton has many virtuous ideas, but he is an establishment Republican from the House of Bush. He's a vassal of the Bush dynasty. And the neocon, one of those people responsible in part for the debacle that took place in Iraq. This was Mr. Bolton. But he was never brought in as a witness in the impeachment process. The managers from the House of Representatives, led by Mr. Schiff and by Mr. Nadler, wanted to bring him as a witness in the Senate after failing to bring him as a witness in the House. They wanted the Senate to do their work for them, hoping to find something. An actual fact, they were demanding to do the same thing in the Senate that they did in the House. We can bring our witnesses, but you can't bring yours. You can't bring the anonymous whistleblower because it would show a conflict of interest that he had and a political motivation. You can't bring Hunter Biden. You can't bring Joseph Biden. You can't bring your witnesses. You can only bring the witnesses we want. Now, they did that in the House because they had a voting majority, but then they tried to do it in the Senate. Nancy Pelosi, who had originally opposed any impeachment because there was not bipartisan support for it, then gave in to Alexandra uh, Cortega Ortez, Ortega Cortez, and to the squad and to the left wing of the Democratic Party, the radical left, Maxine Waters, etc. She gave in to these people for fear of dividing the Democratic Party which is anyway divided. She gave in and they pursued the impeachment, trying to use it to create enough of a mudstorm against Mr. Trump, hoping to influence the upcoming election. But they were doing this when the primary season was already underway. Iowa was taking place the very week. The Iowa caucus was taking place the very week of the Senate vote. Why, since you're in the middle of a presidential campaign, don't you let the people just decide? Let the people be the court of appeals. Let the voters make the decision. But the managers and Ms. Pelosi stated, we can't do that, it's too serious, it's urgent. Then she waits 33 days. It's so urgent, she waits 33 days before presenting the articles of impeachment to the Senate. The whole thing became a joke and a fiasco. The fact of the matter being that the Russian collusion charges against Mr. Trump were disproven. The only evidence of Russian collusion was the overheard interview 
and discussion of Barack Obama with the Russian president before Mr. Putin. They had evidence that Obama did that. They had evidence that Mr. Biden conspired with the Ukrainians to withhold aid. It's on video. Billion dollars? But nothing for Mr. Trump. Their own witness, their only case witness who actually was present when any conversation took place, stated under oath that no, he never heard Mr. Trump make a quid quo pro offer or a quid quo pro statement. And that was their own witness. The transcript of Mr. Trump's conversation by telephone with Mr. Zelensky, the premier of the president of Ukraine, shows there was no quid quo pro. None. Absolutely none. And the Ukrainian government said there was no quid quo pro. Now, in a court, this would have been thrown out immediately. Or any intelligent prosecutor or district attorney would have not pursued the prosecution. It'd be a waste of time, waste of the taxpayer's money, waste of energy and effort. A judge would only throw it out anyway and probably rebuke them for bringing such a shabby case. But impeachment does not work like that. Impeachment is different. It's not the equivalent of a criminal trial. They can bring the articles of impeachment, and unfortunately, they were able to make it a political process instead of a legal one. But it fell to pieces. There was no need for witnesses. If they wanted to bring witnesses, they should have bought the witnesses they wanted for the impeachment, then bring them to the trial. But no, the only ones who didn't allow witnesses were the Democratic Party. The House of Representatives dominated by the Democrats, Mr. Schiff did not bring witnesses. Then he's expecting the Senate to do something he did. And then they would not let the Republicans bring witnesses for the impeachment, but they didn't want the Republicans to bring witnesses to the Senate either. Would the Republicans have the majority? No, you can't bring Hunter Biden or the whistleblower, only the witnesses we want. This is just so corrupt and absurd and ridiculous, something that would have been thrown out of any court for lack of merit. But it goes down the tubes the same week, within one day of the State of the Union address, and within one day of the absolute fiasco that took place the day after the Iowa caucuses. Unbelievable. It is difficult to believe that this series of events is not God raising his hand against those who want a policy of abortion, those who want to perpetuate their godlessness. It's difficult. I will bless them that bless thee and curse them that curse thee. Mr. Trump, Mr. Pompeo, who is a believer, Mr. Pence, who's a born again believer, Jay Seclow, who is a believer, they're pro Israel, strongly pro Israel. To condemn the Trump administration for killing Soleimani, responsible for the death of over 600 Americans. How many more dead Americans do the Democratic liberals want before he becomes a legitimate target, as we've asked last week in Prophecy? Everything is backfiring on them. We have to ask the question, is this God's hand of judgment as it continues to show grace to the United States. Please pray for the salvation of Donald Trump and his family. He's surrounded by believers, people I know who are believers, who I know who are saved. One of them I know personally, I've worked with on committees and things a number of years ago. Uh, I know to be saved believers in Jesus. Please pray that he joins them, gives his life to the Lord and becomes one of them. He's certainly doing the right thing. He spoke at a pro-life rally, the National 
main pro-life rally. He was the first president to speak at it during an election year. Ronald Reagan didn't do that. Ronald Reagan gave lip service to being pro-life, but then appointed a pro-abortion judge to the Supreme Court, Sandra Day O'Connor. George Bush paid lip service, but would never attend such a rally. In fact, his mother, and to the best of my knowledge, his wife, Laura, were pro-abortion. They're certainly same-sex marriage, Mr. Trump's family were different, they're pro-life, as opposed to the establishment Republicans of, of the Bush dynasty. In the Bush dynasty, Mr. Cheney, his vice president, and his wife appear on a video clip available on YouTube calling for the Republican Party to change its position and support same-sex marriage. You can watch them. They did nothing about being pro-life, pro-family, pro-Christian, pro-anything to do with the interests of believers motivated by scripture. Mr. Trump has done. Now, he's not perfect. There's a tremendous persecution of Christians underway in China, and I would like to see the Trump administration make that an issue in trade negotiations with China. There are other things, I think, that I'd like to see done better and differently. That's my opinion. But what he has done is in line with what the word of God says should be done. Let's understand this now in light of what is happening this same week in the Middle East. In the aftermath of his proposal, his peace plan, his peace plan is largely not identically, but largely an upgraded and reiterated version of the one bought by Ehud Barak that the Palestinians and the Palestinian Authority rejected. What Mr. Trump has done, however, is legitimize the permanency of Israeli settlements on the West Bank on their biblical sites not only places like Ariel, which is essentially a suburb of Tel Aviv, close to Tel Aviv, but still on the West Bank, the distance from the Mediterranean to the 1967 border is very narrow. At one point, it's only about eight miles. But he's talking about giving the Jordan Valley to the control of Israel permanently. That would strategically secure Israel proper from attack. He's also talking about the Jewish right of settlement on the biblical sites, such as Kiryat Arba in Hebron, and Bethel, and Shiloh, Shiloh, and the other biblically and historically important locations where there are today Jewish settlements. Now, unfortunately, most of these are by Orthodox Jews who do not believe in Jesus and who do not like Jews who do. And there is a hypocrisy to these people, let us be honest. Well, I believe the Jews' right to settle in their indigenous homeland as the indigenous people. The rabbis condemned Zionism, they condemned Theodor Herzl. They were almost united in rejecting the reestablishment of a Jewish state. Now that the Jewish state exists despite their opposition, or at best disinterest, but in many cases opposition, now they want to control it. I have no respect for the settlers themselves, none. I don't respect them. What I do respect, however, is the right of the Jewish people to live in the land God gave them. And they are there. And Mr. Trump recognizes it. Formal annexation. This week in prophecy, it was announced that the Netanyahu government is prepared to annex Ma'ale Adumim. Now understand where Ma'ale Adumim is. It is on the east side of the Mount of Olives. It is east of East Jerusalem, extending out into the wilderness of Judah towards Jericho, although not that far. 
And it is a massive, massive residential development. It is huge. It is not legally or civilly part of, is of Israel's capital, Jerusalem, although in effect it's a major suburb of Jerusalem. Such an annexation would secure Jerusalem as a permanent Jewish city. It would semi-surround East Jerusalem if this were to take place, and the Trump administration has not raised objection. There is without doubt certainty that before this proposal was released and the Palestinian Authority did not attend the presentation in Washington, that Mr. Trump conferred with Mr. Netanyahu about what he was going to do. Also, that he conferred with MLB uh, in Saudi Arabia, uh, Mohammed bin Salman in Saudi Arabia, and with the Emirates and certain other Arab countries such as Egypt. It did not come as a total surprise to them he already knew who would accept it, who wouldn't, who would oppose it. Well, cosmetically, the Arab League has opposed it. But in effect, they have not opposed it in the way they opposed it in the past. Saudi Arabia and some of the Emirates in particular have said they welcome Mr. Trump's efforts to bring a peace, and they want further dialogue and negotiation concerning it. This is a subdued opposition. When you read it through the lenses of almost the, the, the hypocritical nature of what diplomacy is, it's not what they say, it's what they don't say, <clears throat> and it's the meaning in what they say that has to do more with semantics than with substance. And in other words, they're saying they're against it, but they're not saying they're against it. They're leaving the door open. They're not condemning it vociferously. Part of the reason for this is their desire to have Israeli involvement in the strategic buttress against Iranian Shia aggression. <coughs> they also want access to Israeli technology and Israeli desalination of water. Saudi Arabia is seeking to build a massive, massive city that will be functioning in Saudi Arabia as a liberal environment similar to Muscat in Oman, similar to Abu Dhabi or Dubai, where Sharia and the Mutawa will not control it the way they control the rest of Saudi Arabia. It will be a massive commercial, residential, and industrial development like a special region of Saudi Arabia, the way Hong Kong and Macau are special administrative regions of uh, China. It'll have its own local governance where many of the laws, particularly the strict Islamic code of Sharia, will not be applied in the same way or to the same degree. Saudi Arabia must do this for certain reasons. One, Mohammed bin Salman knows he's got a demographic time bomb with a high unemployment among a growing youth population of people under 30. He knows that oil is not what it was and will not be again due to fracking, due to the emergence of electric cars. He knows that OPEC could never wield the power it once did. He knows that oil prices are not going to go back to where they were. Saudi Arabia, as we've said, needs oil prices at approximately $85 a barrel to simply meet their own budgetary demands, and that is not happening. Well, let's understand this further. He must do this. Secondly, he's in competition with Dubai and with uh, Abu Dhabi, who are doing it, with Muscat, who is doing it, but particularly Dubai. Dubai has become the financial and commercial center and a high-tech center 
of the Arab world instead of Saudi Arabia. It's competitive. He must do it. And with Israel's help, he can do it a lot easier, a lot faster, and a lot better. This is the area where Mount Sinai most probably was. It is in northwest Saudi Arabia, not far from the Sinai, not far from Shadam el-Sheikh, and not far from the Israeli port and resort of Eilat, quite close. Near the Jordanian border, city of Aqaba, immediately next to it, adjacent to it immediately, is Israel, is Eilat. You could easily build a four-lane highway and get from Israel to this new development in Saudi Arabia in a couple of hours at the most, in less than two hours. He's looking at this. In other words, the Palestinian Muslims are losing leverage. They're losing leverage because they're not being backed to the same degree by the petro-wealthy Sunni powers. This is one reason that Hezbollah and Hamas have begun to lean more and more towards Iran, which Hamas is doing despite the fact that most of Hamas is Sunni, not Shia, but it's political desperation. Well, Mr. Abbas has rejected this. Once again, leave it to the Palestinian Arabs to never miss an opportunity to miss an opportunity. They could have a state in Gaza and they could have local control over their own towns, villages, and cities in the West Bank with an infrastructure and massive amounts of international aid. They could have a capital in the Abu Dis region of East Jerusalem, as well as the city of Gaza, Gaza City. International airport. The West Bank would be demilitarized, except for the Israeli defensive forces along the Jordan Valley. And Gaza could be protected by international treaty, where it would be demilitarized, but protected by Egypt. They'd have a state, they'd have peace, and they'd have a lot of money to develop infrastructure. Palestinian Authority won't take it. And without doubt, Mr. Trump suspected or expected they wouldn't take it. And obviously, the alternative within the Palestinian Arab world is Hamas, the military arm of the Muslim Brotherhood, a terrorist organization. Even now, European powers who refuse to condemn Hamas as a political agency, only as a military, that is, terrorist agency, are now beginning to turn against Hamas. What is happening in Europe is a issue in itself. Germany is beginning to express concerns about Iran, no longer beating the same drum that Mr. Trump was wrong to withdraw from the foolish treaty made by Barack Obama without Senate approval that would have allowed Iran to continue its program of nuclear development without guaranteed inspections unless you give them a month's notice. Well, the Europeans are realizing the reality. However, the left-wing socialist bureaucrats don't like Israel and don't like Donald Trump. They're the ideological cousins of the ultra left wing of the Democratic Party in the United States and of Jeremy Corbyn's Labour Party in Great Britain. And so this week in prophecy, the international affairs bureaucrat, Joseph Boal, demanded an EU condemnation of Mr. Trump's proposal. He didn't get it. Italy opposed it. The Czech Republic opposed it. Hungary opposed it. Austria opposed it. 
and some other countries. They need a complete support by all 27 states that compose the EU. Well, he's not going to get it. At least a quarter of them are opposed to it. Of course, Britain will no longer have a voice in it. So it goes. It's happening. Britain is not going to condemn Mr. Trump. The EU isn't. Joseph Bowell is just complaining and whining himself. Notice how Bowell in Europe behaves the same way as Pelosi and Schumer in Washington. Same way, same thing. They just can't get the political wherewithal to do what they want to do, and they're frustrated. So they attempt to do it by non-democratic means. That's what's happening this week in prophecy. 30% of the West Bank would be recognized by the United States and certain other countries as Israeli territory. Something else not being much discussed in the media is the triangle. The triangle is an area of northern Israel that is very near to the West Bank where you have an Arab population of 300,000. Hypocrisy of hypocrisies. The most anti-Zionist members of the Israeli Knesset, and this testifies to Israeli democracy, that Arab Muslims who oppose the existence of the state of Israel are allowed to be elected into the Israeli parliament. Even those people are against giving the triangle to the Palestinian Authority. They hate Israel. They're always fighting in the Knesset and condemning Zionism and the Jews and the United States, etc. But when there's the prospect of them joining a new Palestinian state, they don't want it. They want to stay Israeli because they know it's in the economic interest of their people. Disarray, just like you see on the other side of the Atlantic. The Democratic Party is in disarray. The Labour Party in England is in disarray. The Palestinian Authority is in disarray. They're all in disarray. I am convinced that this is the hand of God showing mercy and grace, at least for an interim period. We must pray. We must pray for Mr. Trump, for Boris Johnson, and for Mr. Netanyahu at the present Time. There are spiritual forces that are opposing them, but I believe it is the hand of God that is giving them means and opportunity to pursue the course of action they are pursuing. Iran has been reacting with more war talk, calling upon the Palestinian Arabs to engage in a jihad against Israel. They're also desperately trying to their past failed attempts being retried again to launch orbital reconnaissance satellites into space, which they deny are there for any military purpose. Nonetheless, that's what they're saying. In the meantime, weapons smuggling into Gaza has had an attempted increase. The Israeli Navy and Shin Bet and the Snapir Division as the Naval Commando Unit of the Israeli Navy have intercepted one ship illegally carrying substantial amount of arms into Gaza or attempting to. Balloon attacks from Gaza are still continuing. There is a desperation in Hamas and a desperation in the Palestinian Authority. But let's continue looking at this further. Despite the rhetoric the Palestinian Authority is still engaging in security cooperation with Israel and with the United States. How can they be saying one thing and doing another? How can anti-Zionist members of the Knesset, the Israeli parliament, Arab Muslims who condemn Israel and Zionism, say that they don't want to become part of the Palestinian state? <laughs> contradictory. How can the Palestinian Authority condemn 
Mr. Trump's proposal and condemn the actions of Mr. Netanyahu and say it's over, that's it, we'll never accept this, we're at loggerheads, threaten to discontinue security cooperation, yet at the same time, they're continuing it. Why? They're afraid of Hamas. Their rivals who already took Gaza from them. They don't want Hamas to take the West Bank. But let's continue looking at this week in prophecy. This week in prophecy, it was announced in the aftermath of Brexit that high-level negotiations are being planned between the United States and the government of Great Britain, Her Majesty's government. Preliminary talks have already been going on, apparently, for some weeks. A trade agreement between the United States and Great Britain that would reframe and rejuvenate the special relationship that has existed since the Second World War and technically the First World War. It would not simply be strategic and political, however. Now it would be something that would be economic. Britain's future outside of Europe will depend not only on a negotiated trade agreement with the EU, but with reaching out across the Atlantic to the new MCA, the U.S.-Mexico-Canada trade agreement. If Britain can be bought into this, you'd have the beginning of the Anglosphere that we've talked about in the past. This would be the biggest trade block in the world, surpassing the EU easily and guaranteeing that China would never be dominant. However, let's take it one step at a time. This week in prophecy, Mr. Trump has already announced that he would be interested after China and Britain to negotiate a new trade deal with the EU. This has become problematic in several areas of information in an information-based economy. Most of the social media and high-tech companies, most of the people controlling the new economy, Microsoft, Facebook, Oracle, Apple, these are American companies. This week in prophecy, the 10 most profitable and largest corporations in the world were listed by an independent organization that monitors the global economy. Of the 10 biggest corporations in the world, one was German, Mercedes-Benz. One was Japanese, Toyota. One was South Korean, only one, Samsung. The other seven were all American. And of those, they were all high-tech except for Coca-Cola. All Silicon Valley and Seattle-based high-tech companies. This has caused resentment in Europe. They don't have the piece of the pie they thought the European Union was going to give them. And there is a complication when you cannot tax information and electronic capital the way you can tax goods and services with customs and excise. Europe has been, le has been leveling fines against American multinationals. It has now gone up to the political level. Everyone wants this problem addressed, and it's happening. Now, why do we mention this in relation to prophecy? As we've been saying, the general trend is towards a one-world economy. We know that in some way, this will have to happen for the Antichrist to come to power. In the short term, it is simply the United States trying to look after the interest of American corporations in international negotiations with Europe. That is true, that is valid. However, when you see an integration of the global economy, be careful. It means something prophetically. 
Back to the Middle East, this week in prophecy. Turkey has killed 40 Syrian soldiers in a series of air and artillery attacks, following the Syrians killing seven Turks in the Idlib province. This conflict between the Turkish Muslims and the Arab Muslims tells a story of its own. The Kurds are at odds with the Syrians. The Kurds are at odds with the Turks. The Turks are at odds with the Syrians. The Turks are at odds with the Kurds. One thing is for sure, the Islamic doctrine of unity, of Ummah, does not work. Islam has never brought unity to the Islamic world, and it never will. Remember, dear friends, no two westernized Judeo-Christian democracies, no two Western democracies established on Judeo-Christian principles have ever had a war. You've had Western countries that have had a war that were not democratic, such as with Mussolini's Italy or Hitler's Germany. But you've never had a war between two Western democracies whose constitution, legal system, and government was predicated on Judeo-Christian biblical principles. None. Never happened. Never. But most jihads are Muslims killing other Muslims. And even when it's not a jihad, they're still killing each other. Hamas hates the Palestinian Authority. They hate each other. The Sunni hates the Shia. The Shia hates the Sunni. They both hate the Ahmadis. The Alawites are fighting the Sunnis. The Turks are fighting the Alawites. There's no end to it. Confusion. The scripture tells us of the God of Israel. Ours is not a God of confusion. But the Allah of Islam is not the same as the God of Israel. He's a reinnovation of the Nabataean moon God, a demonic power. While the God of Christians and Jews is not a God of confusion, the God of Islam certainly is. This week in prophecy, Benjamin Netanyahu flew to Entebbe in Uganda. Remember, at the rescue of Entebbe, famous commando raid, Benjamin Netanyahu's brother was the commander, and he was the only Israeli killed. So he flew to where his brother was killed in this legendary commando raid, when the Jewish airline passengers on an Air France jet, most of them Jewish, were rescued from the Islamic madman who had a belief mixing witch doctor superstition with, with, with the form of Islam, African Islam, Idi Amin. Idi Amin had this plane abducted and he was holding these people who were on the plane as passengers hostage and the Israelis, of course, rescued them. The commander, again, of the Israeli commando forces who were responsible was the brother of Benjamin Netanyahu. He flew to Entebbe, where his brother was killed, where the rescue took place. And he was cheered. He was welcomed to much public acclaim by the people of Uganda. He was invited by the president, Yaweri uh, Masubini, to his house to meet with Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, who is the interim leader or the transitional leader of Sudan, in order to discuss the establishment of diplomatic relations between Israel and Sudan. Now understand this, Sudan had been leaning towards Iran. With American intervention by Mr. Pompeo, the United States began to pull Sudan out of the orbit of Iran and encourage Sudan to make peace with Israel. Blessed are the peacemakers, 
It is a fixed policy of the Trump administration to try to make peace between the Saudi Arabians and Israel, the Emirates in Israel, and now Sudan in Israel. And it's happening this week in prophecy. In Nigeria, in the Plateau State, at least 19 Christians were killed by the Fulani Islamic militants. Somewhere between 10 and 50 Christians were murdered in Burkina Faso by Boko Haram, the same Boko Haram active in northern Nigeria. Five Christians were killed in church attacks in Cameroon. The persecution of Christians, particularly born-again Christians, in Central Africa has been underreported and has increased dramatically. The suffering of our brethren in Christ, these are born-again believers in Central Africa, is something unspeakable. The United States has had special forces advising the governments of these countries. And of course, there was a case where four American special forces were killed who were there in their advisory capacity. Again, the American response has been subdued, but it is taking place on an almost clandestine level. Again, the Trump administration trying to save the lives of Christians. Please pray for the situation in Africa. The rise of militant Islam. It has reached Kenya. It is certainly in Malawi. It is in Cameroon. It will come to Ghana unless something happens. Burkina Faso is a disaster area. And of course, northern Nigeria has never been anything except a disaster area. Moving further north in Africa this week in prophecy, Algeria has closed two more Christian churches in addition to the 11 they have already closed in recent months. They're passing these licensing laws for houses of worship that only apply to non-Islamic worship. Can you imagine if the United States or Great Britain or Canada or Australia began saying to mosques, you need a license and we can limit the number of mosques and houses of worship you have and deny you licenses and close down your mosques if we see it in our interest to do so because of our Judeo-Christian beliefs. Yet, this is exactly what the Muslim world does. They certainly do it in the Persian Gulf, and they do it in North Africa. They did it this week in prophecy in Algeria. And the mainstream press says nothing, but the Lord sees it. Those are the events this week in prophecy. Now, I'd close with this. Understand something. While it is for certain that Mr. Netanyahu and Mr. Trump, Mr. Pompeo, Mr. Pence, while it is virtually for certain that they knew, they anticipated the Palestinian Authority rejecting the proposal, what was really driving it? Israel can say, well, we accept it. <laughs> it gives Israel a mechanism to begin annexing portions of the West Bank, particularly Male Adumim and the Jordan Valley and certain other locations as being permanent Israeli turf. Now, I wish that had happened in 1967. It didn't but it's happening this week in prophecy. Speaking to you from Israel, my name is James Jacob Prash. God bless and thank you for listening. Catch you next time. Shmi Yaakov Prash, Kan Be Israel, Rehitraot, Pam Haba, Kol Tov, Korbrochot Be Yeshua. Every blessing in Jesus. Thank you for listening.